I can't tell you how excited we are to have Annabelle joining us this evening. Thanks so much, Annabelle. And as Sarah has mentioned, Annabelle has been such a great supporter of our Pathways to Politics for Women program since its inception. And uh, she's always rating as one of the highest speakers. So when she produced this program, it was so exciting because, of course, um, we knew that this is something that's that's been very close to her heart as it, as it is to all of ours for a very long time. Um, now, I'm sure that Annabelle is familiar to many of you, but I, I did want to briefly introduce her and acknowledge her depth of expertise as an Australian political journalist. So Annabelle is uh, an ABC writer and presenter who has covered Australian politics for 20 years as a news reporter and columnist. She is the creator and presenter of Ms. Represented, presenter and writer for the ABC-wide Australia Talks project, and co-host of the initial and 2021 return series of Tomorrow Tonight with Charlie Pickering. She has written and presented the documentary series on life inside Parliament called The House with Annabel Crabb, as well as six seasons of the ABC's Kitchen Cabinet, for which she received two Logie nominations in 2013, including the Graham Kennedy Award for Most Outstanding New Talent and Most Popular New Female Talent. She is a regular face on ABC TV's election night and budget broadcasts and has a long history of, of appearances on ABC's Insiders program, including a stint as acting host in 2019. Firstly, Annabelle, I did want to congratulate you on creating such a fascinating and engaging series and, and talk about great timing. I mean, you know, couldn't have been better, notwithstanding the work that you've been putting into it. Obviously, it's been happening in the background for a very, very long time. I think it's such a fantastic way to bring a broad mainstream audience up to speed on the many gendered experiences that, that women in politics face. Now, it was an excellent group of prominent female politicians with so many political firsts achieved between them. And regardless of political persuasion, there was huge commonality in terms of the challenges they faced. I think many of us here tonight were somewhat outraged, but perhaps not surprised by the stories that were shared. And as you know, this audience is mainly drawn from our Pathways to Politics community. And so these are topics that we look to unpack at great length during the program and at our alumni events. Indeed, we've had both Kate Ellis and Sarah Hanson-Young join us in recent months. So I want to spend our time together tonight focused on, on hearing your insights and reflections and, and really getting behind the scenes of Ms. Represented. So... My first question to you is, were there, were there any gendered themes or stories that, that actually surprised you as a seasoned political journalist? Hello. Um, I just want to start by saying um, thank you so much for having me here this evening, Carol. I'm a massive fan of Pathway to Politics and I, I um, just the sea of faces and it is a highly exciting thing for me to see. I love the enthusiasm for um, a career in politics and I love that you are creating an infrastructure that actually supports women who are interested in uh pursuing public office. Um, I come to you tonight from Gadigal country uh, in Sydney and I wish I could be there with you because I know that your events are always awesome. Um, so I uh, have been thinking about making this series for quite a few years. Actually, it was when I was writing my book, The Wife Drought in 20. 14, I was doing some research on Edith Cowan, who, of course, was the first woman to be uh, elected to any parliament in Australia in, uh, 20, in 1921. And uh, I put a little bookmark in my diary because I thought, oh, that's a, that's a centenary that's coming up. That could be an excuse to do a documentary series about women in the parliament. And so my producer and director and I, uh, with whom I work, 
put it in our diaries and we started plotting and um, we got it commissioned last year and then started making it in a pandemic situation uh, in circumstances where we couldn't get to a lot of the women that we needed to uh, interview and we couldn't be in the same room as them and all sorts of fun things that made uh, filming difficult. But what I really wanted to do with this series was not to tell a kind of, you know, chronological trudge through the last decade and the last hundred years in which women have um, made inroads into Australian parliaments. I wanted to make it like an oral history, really, um, because in my experience in 20 years of um, reporting on and observing politics, it's always um, intrigued me, the stories that uh, women in politics tell each other that are almost like a currency that they exchange experiences that they all have in common and that they have lived so deeply and so extensively that they don't even have to explain it to each other, but that don't really get talked about publicly all that much. I wanted to tell big stories, you know, of, of big things that women have done in the parliament or um, big problems that they have encountered. But I also wanted to tell the little stories as well, because honestly, sometimes those tell you as much about politics as the big landmark events. So what I was shooting for, I suppose, was a um, circumstance in which the viewer would feel like they were listening in on parliamentary women talking to each other. Yeah. And in terms of your question about what shocked me, look, um, I have never been a believer that, um, you know, that women politicians are all the same in some way or that um, even that women sort of do politics differently, I, I really shy about making that assumption. I think that what women politicians have in common with each other is that they are all navigating a landscape that was sort of designed by men for men um, and that's changing, but it means that they have to tackle all sorts of some visible and some invisible um, complications that are um, sometimes not even seen by by male politicians. Um, so the thing I was prepared for them to disagree with each other on a whole lot of stuff, and they certainly did, um, and I thought that they would have similar, some of the similar experiences as they went through pre-selection um, and entering parliament and entering the ministry and so on. But the thing that actually did shock me was I'd heard Julie Bishop talk before about this idea of gender deafness, what happens when you're the only woman in a room and you put forward an idea and nobody really reacts and you think, oh, you know, did I say something stupid? And then five minutes later, some guy says the same thing and everyone's suddenly totally attuned to the idea. I'd heard her talk about that um, in the context of being the only woman in the cabinet in 20, 2013. Um, what I wasn't really prepared for was that almost all of the women I interviewed, that they would tell exactly the same story in such identical terms and unprompted that we could actually cut it together into a sequence and make one big story out of the sliced together fragments of women telling the same story in exactly the same way. I found that absolutely um, shocking, yeah. Yeah, well... I can guarantee you that if you speak to women corporate directors, yeah. they'll tell you exactly the same story in exactly the same way because it is, I think that it is not a, a, a female politician's experience, but I think it's a female experience across the board. In fact, I remember reading a, a, a piece of research from Harvard University uh, which actually said that that was the experience of students, female students who were asking questions, questions ignored, and then when the same question was asked by a, a male student, it was uh, approached in a whole different way. So I spoke to a um, uh, quite a big group of um, chief executive women um, uh, members the other day and there was uh, there was a lot of buy-in from that audience, <laughs> I've got to say. And I think, look, you know, there's there's... There's so many fields 
um, in which the arrival of women in Australia is a recent thing. I mean, the history of um, some of the firsts of women in Australian politics is not even an old story. Like, I mean, the first woman uh, Prime Minister of Australia is not even at retirement age, you know. Um, and so many of these firsts are young, still around, still kicking. Um, I mean, I've talked to a woman who was the first woman to work underground in the resources industry in WA and she's not an old woman either and she um you know tells the story of the blokes on the job walking off because they refused to work um with a with a woman underground didn't have uh toilets didn't have equipment that fit her or clothing that fit her and so on so what I kind of wanted very urgently to do with this series was to capture those stories while they're still being told by living people you know um the episode that goes to air tonight um, is dedicated to uh, Margaret Guilfoyle and Susan Ryan, both of whom died last year. And I, we missed out on interviewing Susan by four days. You know, we were supposed to be interviewing her and um, she died very suddenly and shockingly um, four days before we were um, supposed to be interviewing her. We put it back a week because she was having her bloody flaws done. I mean, it was just tragic. Anyway, um, and Margaret Guilfoyle, who's a bit older, was um, at last year not, not able to participate in an interview and she died in November. But these women were the first of their respective parties to hold a cabinet portfolio and sit in cabinet. Margaret Guilfoyle was the first. Um, Enid Lyons actually was the first woman to be in cabinet. She was a, another Liberal, um, uh, but she was an MP, um, but she didn't have a portfolio. Um, they knew what it was like to be the only woman in the room the whole time and um, and their stories uh, are, are, you know, it, extraordinary and their achievements are um, freakish now looking back at um, everything they had to deal with. And I think, you know, um, the great uh, gift of women like that and um, plenty of the women that we've interviewed and plenty of other firsts who we didn't get to, um, we benefit every day from every little thing that they managed to tweak and change because um, even going back to Vida Goldstein, who was the first woman to run for federal uh, office in Australia, she never got elected. She never made it. She ran, I think, six times. Um, but every time she ran, she made the idea of a woman being a candidate just that little bit less strange. And that's what all of these first the ones that you know of and the ones that you've never heard of and even the ones who didn't make it are doing or have done that benefit women who get involved in the political process today. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, but it's sort of interesting, isn't it, when you think about Susan Ryan, um, Margaret Guilfoyle, even, even Ros Kelly, you sort of think it was almost as though they didn't have an expectation that there be other women around them, notwithstanding what they might have wanted, but they were quite accepting of that as a status quo. And yet we had a situation um, not so long ago where we had one, you know, what I would have thought, well, what I would call was an incredibly powerful woman sitting around a cabinet table as the only woman in cabinet. And, and I've often asked myself, now, why wouldn't she have said, this is totally unacceptable in the 21st century that I be the only woman around a cabinet table and um, I, I, I'm, I'm expecting to be to have at least three female colleagues sitting around here with me within the next six months? Why do you think that didn't happen? Well, it depends who you ask. Um, Julie Bishop says that she was constantly lobbying for um, uh, other women to be included in the cabinet draft. Um, she said she was unsuccessful in that. Um, she wasn't always the only woman in cabinet to the extent that um, Peter Credlin, who was Tony Abbott's then chief of staff, was um, uh, often in those cabinet meetings. Um, and um, we uh, were hoping that Peter would um, be interviewed for the show. We talked to her a bit, but she was in the end too busy to, to join us. But um, I think that uh, there is a real issue sometimes for women who are 
currently in the parliament because they are politicians first, right? And they're members of political parties. They're members of cabinet in, in Julie's instance. And she also was the deputy leader of the party. Um, so she, and we asked her during uh, the interview, well, look, how did you, you at the time that you were the only woman in the cabinet said, no, this is all totally normal and we, we select on merit and this is what the cabinet is. And she said, well, inside I was thinking, don't mess up, don't, you know, let the side down, keep a straight face and maintain that we have a merit-based system, even though she didn't agree with that. I think, you know, part of the uh, complex equation that is a life in party politics is sometimes you do have to keep a straight face and pretend that you're absolutely on board with what's going on when you're really, really not. Um, and she says that was an instance um, of exactly that for her. Because, I mean, if you are, um, I mean, she could have, I guess, spoken out and resigned from the deputy uh, leadership of the party. And said, how, I can't. how do you think that would have been accepted had she said, well, you know, um, if we don't have another three women around the cabinet table within the next six months, I'm actually resigning. What What do you think would have been the reaction to that? Well, I, I mean, I I don't know. I mean, I suspect that there could have been a preparedness to just sort of let her walk. I don't know. I mean, you know, this is um, it's always a, a choice that you've got to make in politics, right? Like people get to a point where they say, oh, I can't serve in this um, cabinet anymore. I mean, we've seen that in the last few years, that usually to do with leadership, where um, a minister will say, look, I can't support um, this leadership anymore and I'm going to the backbench. Um, so I don't know is the answer to your question. What I do know is that there is um, a rich vein of punishment available to people who do speak out and upset the apple cart. And I think that that really does transfer to gender politics quite a bit, you know, within parties. If you are criticising your own party um, on gender matters or anything else, then um, you quickly learn some pretty crunchy lessons about um, uh, the expectation of team solidarity that you may be breaching. Yeah. And, and I should say that Peter Credlin actually is also a wonderful a supporter of the program and a great presenter. She comes along all the time. Um, well, that's interesting in the context then of like Emma Hussar and, and Julia Banks. Yeah. I mean, both of them stepped outside of their parties to criticise the sort of behaviours mm. that they were subjected to. Mm. And, um, and it seems that it, it doesn't really matter what political party you belong to, that behaviours seem to be the same. Yeah, look, I think that's actually a lot to do with um, the cultures inside both parties. I think that um, one thing that both Emma and Julia Banks have in common, and it's actually the reason we asked them both to participate in the interviews, even though of all of our um, guests, I think they're the only two that would not qualify as firsts of any kind. I wanted to talk to both of them because they have a number of things in common. Neither of them was a long-term member of the party that they joined. Um, they did not have backgrounds and support networks in the party. Um, Julia Banks um, very famously joined the Liberal Party when there was a shout out for more women to join the Liberal Party and consider public office. And she was, you know, a highly accomplished commercial lawyer, very tough commercial lawyer, um, and thought, okay, yeah, I'm ready to um, uh, give something back and to um, get involved in public office. She went in there with very few ties within the party. And Emma Hussar, who was essentially a kind of community organiser and a great local um, champion, um, was drafted by the ALP and didn't have those networks inside the party. And I think that to an extent, both of those women um, were punished for or they suffered more because of their lack of history 
within the party. And um, I think that both of them were dealt with harshly by their own parties and um, uh, hence their inclusion in the series. Yeah, but it was sort of interesting that both, notwithstanding they're from completely different parties and we're told that, you know, both parties have different attitudes towards gender equality and the inclusion of women, they both seem to have dealt, dealt with the same issue. Yeah, that's right. And I don't think that you could argue that the um, that the success of the quota system in Labor has ironed out um, all the cultural issues in the party. Um, I think that one of the greatest challenges facing um, the two-party system in Australia is that um, the pool from which um, both parties recruit candidates um, tends to be uh, dominated by people who have uh, had a career in the party, you know, through being um, a staffer or a long-term office bearer um, inside the party. And I think one of the real challenges for our democratic system is that sometimes the skills that you need to get pre-selection in a big, powerful party, i.e. the sort of party whose backing makes it easiest for you to get into parliament, are not the same skills that make you a great representative of your area. And I do believe that that is one of the reasons you're starting to see um, the election of talented and highly local uh, independent candidates. Um, I think that that is where some of that community frustration is finding an expression, right? And I think that the two major parties have got to look at the way they recruit and the and the way that they prioritise people with powerful backers factional or otherwise um, within a party over people who are genuinely great community representatives. I mean, I know that at some point every conversation like this always goes back to, you know, quotas and merit and all of that. And one of the um, genuinely puzzling elements is, you know, when you ask what is merit, what is merit in a political candidate the answer is there's a hundred different types of merit. Like our parliament needs all sorts of different people in order to be a great and functioning representation of this country that we all live in. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Annabelle, were there were there questions that you wanted to ask um, but had to restrain yourself from asking and um, were there People that, I mean, you mentioned Peter Credlin, but were there politicians that you wanted to include that that weren't available for any particular reason? Look, um, we, I mean, we, we did not have, you know, the funding to get to every significant woman um, who served in the parliament. Um, and, you know, there are, there are women who did not make an appearance in the series who I would absolutely count as trailblazers. Um, Most of the people that we asked to participate said yes. We had some, I mean, I talked quite a bit with Peter um, and um, in the end I think she was too busy to participate. I value her judgments. I think that she's an incredibly incisive and a very... um, consequential person uh, in Australian politics, so I'm sorry. And I also am sorry that we didn't um, have her because I think that the question of how staff work in Parliament is a really huge story that we didn't really tangle with to a significant degree. I think I heard, I think I heard her say that she was contractually constrained um, from oh. appearing on the show. I, I made a formal request to Sky and um, I 
really was told that she was too busy. So yeah, whatever. But I, I've I've asked Peter to do shows with me on the ABC about five times. Um, she's actually quite a tal- talented cake decorator, which is um. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think I tried to get a rope roper in on doing a kitchen cabinet once to, so she could show off her cake icing skills. But anyway, um, yeah. but yeah, no, she does work for Sky, obviously. So um, although so does Bronwyn Bishop, and she came on our show. But um, and also, look, I um, I did ask a couple of um, groundbreaking uh, National Party women, and um, both of them declined. Um, I don't want to kind of put words in their mouth by um, uh, speculating as to their reasoning. But um, I note that there's been criticism from a couple of quarters that the that the show doesn't have enough conservative women. I would say that um, every woman who I asked who declined would be classified as a conservative woman. Why do you think that was? Um, look, I don't... I don't want to kind of put words in the mouths of conservative women, right? Like they can absolutely speak for themselves. I think that one of the, um, so this is my view, right? My view is that 25 years ago, or have I forget what day it is, about a quarter of a century ago in the mid 90s, you had a really like the proportion of women in the parliament was about 15%. It was low. And at that point, the Liberal Party historically, I think, had done a bit better than the ALP, um, particularly in the early days of the Senate. I think about sort of seven of the first ten senators who were women were 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 um, from the Liberal Party, um, and then in the mid nineties there was almost like a fork in the road, right? Like because the ALP decided after a you know pretty significant internal process to adopt a quota system to say, okay, at first it was like a third of winnable seats will have, you know, female candidates contesting them for the ALP. And what happened in the Liberal Party at the same time was there was a, you know, a decision that that was not for them. And you can understand that Liberal Party is a kind of, you know, an individual, you know, um, free enterprise sort of outfit. You can understand why a centralised and prescriptive rule would not appeal to that political party. And what they did was actually um, form a kind of a recruitment drive. They established the Liberal Women's Network and in the 1996 election just um, boosted the number of women in the House of Representatives from the Libs from about five to 17 or something. I mean, absolutely skyrocketed overnight. But then um, over the um, succeeding years, um, as the Labor quota started to really take hold, you see that that party has kind of gone to very near parity um, in the federal parliament now. And as a result, I think what's happened is that it's almost as though Labor has kind of colonised this issue of gender because they can attack the Liberal Party for, you know, having a woman problem, failing women or whatever. And it's it's a difficult one for coalition women, I think. This is me saying this. I'm not speaking for any of them. Um, because if you vocalise, you know, concerns about gender representation or treatment or whatever, there's a risk that you'll be kind of identified as siding with the ALP. Um, and who wants to be accused of that, you know, when you are, you know, a conservative or a liberal politician or whatever. So I think um, what happens is that I think there are heaps of feminists in the Liberal Party who work in a way that is different from the way women work in the ALP um, and they get results in different ways. I think you could certainly say that of Julie Bishop, who, you know, will go to her grave saying, you know, no, I'm not a feminist because people check every day whether she calls herself a feminist and it's always the same answer. I remember I was interviewing her and she said, now, is this the 70th or the 80th time you've asked me this question, Annabelle? (laughs) And fair enough. Answer always stays the same. And to be honest, I don't care what she calls herself. I think that she has, you know, achieved an inordinate amount 
not only for herself but for women around her. Um, so I think that's my assessment of you know one of the one of the ways that history has sort of painted conservative women into a corner on this stuff. And honestly, you hear a lot of conservative women saying, you know, feminists don't like women like me. I don't fit the cookie cutter mold of, you know, um, a strong woman because I'm not, you know, that the, that the feminist club is sort of dictated by um, progressive left gatekeepers, um, which I am sorry to hear. I, I tried to make this series um, an audible account of women from various sides of politics. I think I think it's worked. I think that's the way people are generally viewing it, although there are some, you know, notable exceptions. Yeah. I mean, Gloria Steinem's definition of feminism is equality between men and women. So who would you call themselves a feminist, either man or woman, right, if we believe in that equality? Anyway, that notwithstanding, um, did you notice a generational difference in attitude between Bronwyn Bishop and Amanda Vanstone and other uh, younger female politicians? Because I sort of detected a bit of that difference in, in you know, the interviews or the, if you like, the responses that they gave to certain of your questions. Well, I would say that sometimes women who started in the parliament when there generally were not very many women around, and, I mean, Amanda Vanstone was one of a handful um, of women in the Senate, and, you know, that wasn't even that long ago. That was in the 80s. Um, Bronwyn Bishop was scandalously the first woman to be elected to the Senate from um, New South Wales, and that was in 1987, like unbelievable. New South Wales, I mean, Victoria did very well um, on sending women to Parliament, but New South Wales was a shocker, right? So, um, and one thing, and I did, you know, even though we didn't get Susan Ryan um, on camera, I did have the privilege of talking to her quite a bit. She was very helpful um, in the early part of um, researching the series and I will always thank whatever instinct it was that made me audio record one of the pre-interviews that I did with her. So I do have an on-the-record interview with her uh, in audio format, which I've been able to share with her uh, family and they've um, approved the use of one little line of audio um, where she's talking about Margaret Guilfoyle um, in tonight's episode, which is a, a really beautiful moment. But um, one thing that um, she felt very strongly and, um, and Amanda, I think, mentions this when remembering Susan, I mean, she was the only woman in the hawk cabinet. I mean, it was a blokey cabinet. Um, and she was from the women's movement, right? Like, so she really was a capital F feminist. And there she was kind of talking this bunch of dudes into, hey, shall we use some of our political capital to legislate the Sex Discrimination Act, you know, a pretty big thing to accomplish and then she dragged it through that Senate and it was not easy and the blood and gore of that is um, what forms the principal part of tonight's episode of the, of the series. Um, but she always said that, and she said this to me during our last conversation, that it was politics is a game of compromise, right? Like that's all it is. It is a, um, it's where you bring everything that you've got to the table and you use your judgment about when to push for things and when to take one for the team. And she said that she knew that the men around her knew her views, but they also respected her for choosing her moment and for not insisting on her own way the whole time. She said the great thing was to be part of a team and to understand when you could push and when to ease back. And she said that this was always um, 
something that she found frustrating about dealing with uh, activist groups because they didn't ever want to compromise on anything. But, of course, for her, she was the one link of human tissue between the women's movement who wanted this version of the Sex Discrimination Act and all these guys <laughs> whose votes she needed to actually make that happen. Um, and she talked about that very elegantly and without a single trace of rancour or bitterness. And this is something that uh, Amanda said about Susan. Oh, she wasn't a whinger. You know, she got the job done, she could dish it out, she didn't take things personally. And I think that to the extent that there is a generational um, kind of marker, I would say that that idea that, you know, you shouldn't whinge, that you should, you you know, just press on, or as Bronwyn Bishop says, you know, just be better, just be better than them. Don't don't make yourself a victim. Uh she feels very strongly uh, about that, as does Amanda, who says the minute you complain or you say, oh, I've been picked on because I'm a woman, then they've, they know that they've beaten you. And, I, you know, that's a really interesting debate between those two approaches because in the show, and you would have seen this last week, there's Bronwyn and Amanda who say don't, ever, don't let them know that they've got to you because if you make yourself a victim, you'll never recover. But then you've got you know, Sarah Hansen Young, who sits there in this Senate, you know, the very same Senate that legislated the Sex Discrimination Act that said it's unlawful to be harassed in your place of work. She sat there for, you know, years being catcalled with all sorts of suggestions about her sex life and God knows what, and she didn't say anything for a long time until she just thought, it's not going to change until I actually say something. And so, you know, they're, they're differing approaches. Annabelle, that's such great insights. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you've got an amazing cohort of um, female political journalists around you, uh, Lee Sales, Laura Tingle, Samantha Maiden, uh, Louise Milligan, to name a few. How do you think that's influencing the political stories that are being told and, and potentially maintaining focus on issues that otherwise would not be discussed? Uh, in a word, enormously. I think it's making an enormous difference. So I joined the Press Gallery in 1999. I was just looking, actually, um, I've got a pin board with a picture of the crazy outback tour we did in central through central Queensland when Peter Costello was starting to sort of stretch his wings a bit and put out feelers about you know possibly running for the leadership it would have been um kind of the mid 2000s I guess no it must have been about 2002 maybe anyway it was this we all got on this bus and drove madly around central Queensland with Peter Costello um and there were about 50 journos on this bus it was crazy and in this picture I'm the only woman and there's you know there's I don't know dozens and dozens of blokes and I was kind of shocked because I thought well I remember working with lots of women I didn't ever feel like I was you know but in that trip I was like wow yeah okay I think I was the only woman there um and <sighs> So much has changed in the intervening um, 20 years, and one of them is that the press gallery used to be a closed shop in the profoundest sense of the word, right? You had to be posted to Canberra with your news organisation. You got a press gallery pass, and it meant that you could have an entree into this world. You got the press releases popped in your inbox. You... Um, it was before the internet, you could go to the press conferences, you could ask the questions, you could go and have a coffee with, you know, a minister or whatever, and you were allowed access to these people, right? And nobody else had that same access. It's not like today when anyone can tune in and watch a press conference, right? It was a closed shop and there were behaviours that reflected that people having sort of access arrangements. There was a very, um, you know, a, a quite unique to Australia in some ways, very firm 
conviction that you did not report on the private lives of politicians unless it had an impact on their public lives, now uh, uh, their public jobs, which I actually have always rather revered because um, I think that is a, a good ethical approach. Although in recent years I've started to think, and Lee Sales has talked about this as well, about whether that model really did protect a lot of powerful men. But um, the press gallery, with always the exception of Michelle Grattan, who is the breaker of every law, <laughs> Um, was dominated by powerful men and um, and who were very influential in their pronouncements, you know. Um, now I think that you are seeing an era in which there are powerful female journalists who make different news judgments about what is newsworthy. I can absolutely assure you that there would have been a time in the last 20 years where a Brittany Higgins contacting a journalist with her story might have met the response that this is just, you know, that it's um, not reportable or that it's not even a story, you know. Like I can absolutely see and remember a time where I think that would have been a plausible thing that might have happened and it doesn't now because I think there are women journalists who say, I'm sorry, these stories are important um, and the question of the culture of the parliament is a really important thing and even down to our interviewees and the way they talk about what it's like to be in a meeting where you're the only woman. I'm, most women in parliament would have had a circumstance like that um, and they recognise it and might talk about it with each other, the fact that they name it and talk about it publicly in this series is, I hope, powerful in the sense that it might be seen and registered by men who would have no reason to recognise that as a phenomenon because it doesn't really affect them. And I think in the same way, there would be very few men, I imagine, in Parliament who would register what it might feel like to be criticised for being ambitious rather than praised because, you know, ambition is something like assertiveness that we value in men but are a bit sus of when we see it in women. Um, so, yeah, I think that um, audibility of those stories is really important and I think it is something that is um, a massive change that is happening even as we speak and I find that really exciting. In a recent ABC article you wrote the following, which I thought was a very compelling statement, the more women there are in Parliament, the less likely it is that a decision can be made without their input or that the actions of one bloke can have a disproportionate or sudden effect upon the lives of women. And for all of the intricacies and triumphs and defeats of women in Australian parliaments over the last 100 years, that's about what it boils down to. Can, can you talk a little bit more about that and, and why it resonated for you? Well, I mean, in the end, it kind of is a numbers game because that's what democracy is, isn't it? I mean... Um, Democracy in the immortal line is, you know, um, is a deeply unsatisfactory form of government. It just happens to be the least bad of all of the available models. And um, a democracy can only be improved and made more perfect or less imperfect by reflecting the community that it seeks to represent, right? Like, and in the end, that is all that this debate is is and should be about, right? Like, I mean, I don't really go uh, too much in for this argument that women kind of, you know, make politics nicer or more moral or whatever. I think that we still suffer from a lot of hangovers from the same debates that preceded um women's suffrage in Australia, you know, that, um, you know, the, with the ancient and deep ties between the suffrage, suffrage movement and the temperance movement, you know, this sort of 
feeling that women were more moral and would kind of ameliorate the uh, the uh, the venality of of men or make um, uh, public life a, a more um, moral and um, polite place. I, I, I never really prosecute that argument because I don't think it's true. I think that essentially groups that are diverse make better decisions. And look, if you want to read one piece of research from the last couple of years, let it be the absolutely groundbreaking piece of research published um, by the Workplace Gender Equality um, Agency about a year ago now, um, which was um, essentially the tracking that they've done over six full revolutions of compulsorily extracted workplace reporting from employers in Australia on representation of women on their boards and um, in their executives. They've managed to, thanks to that data, um, which was extracted by the old Equal Opportunity Agency. Um, thank you, Susan Ryan, for that as well. Um, it manages to demonstrate as a matter of proof, something that um, analysts around the world have been positing but unable directly to prove for some time, which is that companies that increase their proportion of women on the board or um, in executive positions do better. They actually become more profitable. And it's because groups that are not diverse make poorer decisions than groups that are diverse. And that should be and is the only argument that you need for increasing the proportion of women in Australian parliaments. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. Interestingly, the Prime Minister, when he did that lengthy press conference in the middle of the whole Brittany Higgins story, and... I really pricked my ears up when I heard this because I hadn't heard him say it before, but he said that he's not in principle against the idea of gender quotas. And I thought that was a really fascinating thing for him to say. And um, I phoned around a bit in the Victoria and the New South Wales Liberal Party and, you know, it, it checked out that he has expressed that view before internally. Um, of course, the issue um, with uh, the... Liberal Party as an organisation is that all the branches make their own decisions. You know, Scott Morrison doesn't have the power to legislate or enforce a um, party-wide edict about quotas. They have to vote on it and discuss it in their own um, state branches where power and influence is very fiercely guarded against the marauding of, a, a, of an interventionist um, <laughs> uh, federal party. So um, I don't think... I don't think you'd see it in this current parliament with this. I don't think that Scott Morrison would fancy legislating something like that. And I don't think, um, well, I don't know. Would he get through, through the Senate if so? Hmm, possibly. Hmm, I don't know. There'd be some horse trading possibly. Um, but, look, I mean, it's sometimes it's hard to legislate to change cultures, right? We look at Parliament and we think it's, you know, it's a place of rules and it's a place of, you know, order. It's it's not, you know, it's kind of, it's subjective and you have to fight to get your issue cared about by enough people in that system to make change happen. And the way that you change cultures is about winning arguments, right, um, rather than necessarily always legislating to fix cultural problems. And um, I think one of the things that I was trying to do with this series is to make stories audible so that they could feed in to people's deliberations. You know, what, does that seem fair? Oh, well, this happens to this person, but it doesn't happen to that person. Isn't that a bit strange? Um, and that's why I love to hear about people's people watching the show with their families, um, because that is where change happens, you know, with children and what they see and what they learn and what they think is a normal thing for a mum to do and a normal thing for a dad to do. That's where change happens. And 
I will stop going on and on in a moment, but the last thing that I want to say is my great fear making this series always was I do not want to put young women off running for parliament. And I would just absolutely assure you that of all of these women that I spent hours and hours and hours um, interviewing, even about some of the hardest things that happened to them in their lives as um, public officers, I'm yet to meet one that regrets going in to parliament. And they were, even in their failures, driven by the things that they believed in. And they were all different for all of them, but that's what fired them and what gave them satisfaction. And I think that you can feel that, or I hope you can feel that sense of a job bravely done um, when you watch the show. Yeah, Annabelle, that is a fantastic uh, live to, to to end on. Thank you so much. Uh, your show is absolutely fantastic and you'll be pleased to hear that we have actually in the last 12 months um, achieved the most applicants for our Pathways to Politics for Women course, yeah, than we have ever before. So I think that women are standing up, they are being courageous and I thank our cohort of uh, Pathways to Politics alumni and our, and our present cohort for all the work that they're doing and the conviction and commitment with which they come to the course because I think it, it is absolutely correct what you're saying. The, the women politicians, the male politicians that we have talking to us say that, you know, they come into this job with a huge um, idealistic views about the sort of commitment uh, and contribution that they can make uh, to us being the best society that we possibly can. And, you know, we will continue to support women um, to pursue their goals for a life in politics. So thank you for all the fabulous work that you do and we look forward to seeing you during the course sometime this year. Thanks. Well, so thank you, everybody, for joining right. Thank you so much. Um, just really want to, again, say that I really applaud the work you're doing because so often finding great female candidates isn't a matter of merit. It's it's finding um, and making contact and giving people the confidence to think, right, I've got the equipment that I need. I've got, you can't really have a qualification, I guess, for going into parliament, but to feel that you know what you're doing and you have a sense of confidence confidence and um, I also really encourage you all to keep in touch. One of the great things about this program is I talk to, um, I run into uh, alumni who are from wildly different ends of the political spectrum but they know each other and keep in touch and that sense of human understanding is just an incredibly valuable thing to maintain um, a life as an intelligent, useful and human um, public representative. Thank you so much, Annabelle. That was fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for attending, and we'll see you at our next event. All the best. <laughs>